talent preparation, acknowledging any sins privately before the Lord so that fellowship may be restored, that we might be filled with the Spirit, and the Spirit of God then can teach us the Word of God. Once again, Father, we come before you, Lord, and we give you thanks and praise for who you are and what you've done. We thank you, Lord, so much for the perfect plan of salvation. We know that Jesus Christ was slain before the foundation of the world, meaning clearly that you had in mind man's salvation from the beginning. And for those who place their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the promise of everlasting life, and we thank you, Lord, for that. We thank you, Lord, for the Holy Word of God, we thank you, Lord, for the prophecies of the Messiah, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to have a clear understanding of those prophecies in the Old Testament and continue to sanctify the believers here through your truth because your word is truth. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Now we're continuing on our series of uh, the prophecies of Christ in the Pentateuch, first five books of Moses. Uh, if you have your and you have your Bibles, let's turn to the book of Numbers, uh, Numbers chapter twenty-one, verses four through nine, and in this section of Scripture, we have an amazing picture of an unusual event. Uh, we have an unusual event of the children of Israel who are complaining and they are rebellious against the Lord, and God, as a result, sent forth poisonous snakes that bit the children of Israel. And the solution to that, those, that poison is the <clears throat> lifted up serpent, bronze serpent that Moses set upon a pole. And God asked the children of Israel to do one thing, one thing, look and live. Look and live, which is a great picture of faith and the Lord Jesus Christ. And certainly the picture is in John 3, 14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And certainly this picture is salvation by substitution. This is pictures certainly salvation by faith. Faith alone in Christ alone. Let's take a look at the account in Numbers 21. Uh, then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Eden, and the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And so here, though, the word discourage, we kind of look at that in a positive light. We all are discouraged at some point, uh, but really the better translation would be referring to their sinfulness. They, they are not discouraging. I think the uh, New American Standard has impatient, impatient. Uh, this Hebrew word can mean impatient. They were sinful uh, in a sense of the delay. Uh, and therefore they had to do an end the round run. Now to get some perspective, we see a map here of where the children of Israel were headed. They were headed over to take a shortcut through the land of Eden on the way up to the land of Israel. And so they wanted to go through the land of Eden, but they were forbidden uh, by, let me zoom in here, they were forbidden by uh, the king of Eden. King of Eden said, nope, you're not going through my territory. You're going to have to go around. Now, if you understand the hills of that area, you see this Edom here, you have all these mountains. And so what they had to do is take go all the way south. They had to go all the way south down to this tip end of one of the fingers of the Red Sea. If you look at the Sinai Peninsula, this is not the Red Sea that children of Israel crossed to go over. Um, that's, this is the other side of the Sinai Peninsula and that finger of the Red Sea. So uh, they had to go all the way down to near Elath and go all the way, which is a port I think King Solomon made, as a port, ship port there, the Red Sea, all the way around, all the way around the land of Eden. Normally, they would go through the King's Highway. The King's Highway ran through the center of Eden. This would be a famous north-south route of that day. Uh, and the request was to the King of Eden, hey, let's go through the 
uh, King's Highway, normal way of traveling north and south. We're not going to take any of your you know, possessions. If we drink any of your water, we'll reimburse you. We'll reimburse you for food. Just allow us to say passage through. And the king of Eden said, nope, nope, you're not going through. And so they had to do an end around run through desolate territory. And they had to travel all the way down. And some writers said it was 175 miles detour. Now, I've been on trips before. You ever seen a road cut off? Okay. You have an exit cut off. So you got to go down the highway. But sometimes, especially I think there's an interstate around, an interstate around just south of Cincinnati. I remember one Louisville, Kentucky, around that area. They were doing construction and the road, the interstate was cut off for one reason. You had to go around. But then you go 30 miles down the road before you can turn around. And then you try to turn around. You take another road, which you can't turn around, for 20 miles that way to turn around. And finally to go back to that road, back to the original point to where you were. So uh, that happens once in a while. You get off the wrong exit or take an early exit. And you can't get back on the highway for quite a long time. Here, though, they had to travel by foot. They had to travel all the way around, a detour. And so, you know... As a human being, I can look at that and saying, yeah, I would probably be impatient too. <laughs> uh, going down this desolate wilderness again, uh, instead of taking the shortcut, taking the long way, but it was an act of rebellion, certainly. It was really uh, in the sense that this is their attitude on an ongoing basis. <laughs> They're constantly doubting God's provision. They're complaining. And therefore, you know, the Lord had enough and notice what they said in verse 5. The people spoke against God and against Moses. God and against Moses. God's authoritative leader, Moses, uh, and also God himself. And they asked the question, why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? That was their same little ditty that they sang over and over. Uh, we are just brought out here to die. And I'm sure Moses at some point said, yeah, that's why. God delivered you, you know. And so there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. Now, wait a second. I thought you said there's no food. Okay. But God did give you food, but it wasn't the food that you like. See? And by the way, the typology is Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. So they were despising God's bread. In typology, they were belittling what God provided. So what did the Lord do? Verse 6, the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. These were poisonous serpents. Why are they called fiery serpents? Because it could be one of two reasons. They looked like the color of the snake looked like um, fire, red in appearance, but... I think it's because of the poison. When they were bit, they feel a burning sensation of the poison in their veins, a fire in their veins. So it's a fiery serpent with poisonous venom. These snakes were poisonous. Now, at this point, I'm going to ask Penny to close her eyes. So we want to give an illustration. I told her that I was going to do this. Okay. In Texas, we have a curl snake, and we have the expression... Red touch yellow, kill a fellow. <laughs> and then the Texas king snake, red touch black, friend of Jack. Friend of Jack. Now, it doesn't work all, all the way through the country that way. It doesn't always work that way, but that's kind of a little statement. Now, Penny's philosophy is this. Run. <laughs> I don't care what color it is. Hey, is that red touching yellow? Wait a second. Let's take a look at that. Let's get that further. Where are you? Where'd you go? <laughs> so it doesn't matter what kind of snake it is, a little tiny one, boom, she's gone. <laughs> right? Amen. So that's her little ditty. <laughs> Run. And there's a Western Diamondback, if you're wondering what snake that was. So, so these poisonous snakes, though, bit the people. You can look now. So. Okay. <laughs> Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord 
that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, the same type of image that they were bitten by. It's interesting. And it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. And that's pretty simple, isn't it? All they had to do was glance at that serpent on that pole, and they would be physically healed. That's all they had to do, look and live. Now we have a hymn, look and live, my brother live, look to Jesus now and live. And it, it's based on this text. Certainly the imagery of Jesus Christ dying on the cross. And the simplicity of faith, a simple look of faith, brings to us not simply physical life, we are guaranteed a resurrection body, but eternal life. Eternal life. So those who are bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And so it was if a serpent had bitten anyone. When he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Now, I'm certainly this was a look of faith. I'm certainly there are people who didn't believe, how can that you know, snake on a pole heal me? And maybe they didn't look. But the only ones who lived were the ones who looked. Understand that. I think this certainly refutes universalism. When you look at the imagery of Christ, not everyone's saved. The provision is made for everyone, but the requirement was the look of faith. The look of faith. And so in the New Testament, we have, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And the faith is that simple. Simplicity of just simply looking away from yourself to another who took your place. By the way, bronze in the, ser in the scripture is a picture of judgment. It was a brass serpent that was judged. And certainly the, sin the serpent depicted sin. It depicted sin. And so the imagery, I think the Lord had laid on him the iniquity of us all. There's some parallels, I think, when we look at the imagery used uh, in the wilderness that Jesus drew out. Certainly, I think Jesus wanted to point out the simplicity of faith from the Old Testament by a simple glance, a simple look away from themselves. Now, one writer put it this way, the contrast between the Israelites and the Christians uh, they were bitten by snakes, but we're all bitten by sin. Uh, we all inherit the sin disease. Sin has infected us. It's through our DNA. Uh, we are bent towards sin, and we are sinful creatures, and therefore we're guilty before a holy God. And if they continued to uh, in their condition, they would eventually die. So those bitten by snakes inevitably would die from the snake's poison. And that would result in, for them, physical death. Physical death. For those individuals who refuse to believe in Christ, spiritual death. Certainly, we do have, we are spiritually dead when we uh, are born, Ephesians 2, 1. And we are been affected by sin's poison. Now, the solution for the Israelites was a bronze snake lifted up in the wilderness and for the believer, the analogy is Christ was lifted up on the cross. And certainly he was judged for our sins. He bore our guilt. And the Lord had laid on him the iniquity of us all. And the application of that provision is clear. For the Israelites that was looking to the snake spared one's life. All they had to do was glance. Look and live. A look of faith. For the believer is simply looking to Christ and what he did on the cross and providing life. Look to Jesus and he saved you from what? Eternal death. And that's simply the glance of faith. And that's how simple it is. Now, Herbert Locker, he has a book on all the messianic prophecies of the Bible in the Old Testament. And this is what he said about this account. The old serpent was the cause of sin and death. It's interesting that the serpent was lifted up on the pole. And I was thinking about this today, going back to Genesis 3.15. And we study that passage about the proto evangelium the first mention of the gospel and how the judgment upon the snake. And therefore, uh, ultimately, when Jesus Christ died, Jesus Christ was judged. 
And it seemed like Satan had the victory, but Christ rose from the dead. And therefore, eventually, he will crush the head of the snake, the serpent. And so this may fit into that Genesis 3.15 imagery. I'll have to study that further, but it's interesting the serpent was used. And Locker said the old serpent was the cause of sin and death, and that serpent lifted, testified, lifted, serpent lifted up, testified to God's dominion over all the wiles of the devil. Those smitten by the serpents had to look not at their wounds or the dying around them or at Moses, but at the upraised serpent. If the afflicted failed to look, thinking the condition was far too simple, then they died. How many people today think, well, it can't simply be faith? That's far too simple. I've got to do something. Well, you think you've got to do something then and don't use God's solution, then you're going to die spiritually. But if you believe it simply as God put it, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The simplicity of faith then you can have everlasting life. So in 3.14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, predicting his death on the cross. And that whoever, whosoever, believes in him. Remember, um, one uh, writer put it this way, whosoever means me. Who is this whosoever? It means you. You, whoever. Whoever believes in him. It doesn't matter what your background is, what you've done. Believe this text. Your faith is not in yourself, your goodness, your works. Your faith is in not another who finished the work. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, Zane Hodges said this, no doubt some modern minds are scandalized by the seemingly simplicity of all this. On the contrary, the very simplicity of our responsibility, a single act of trust in Christ, only serves to magnify the miracle God performs. For at the precise instant when a man or woman believes in Christ, at that moment eternity itself invades human experience and transforms our inner beings into something wonderful and permanently new. And now, Zane Hodges goes on to state here, in order, in an effort to avoid any implication of easy believism, MacArthur writes about the story in Numbers 21 as follows. This is how John MacArthur interprets that story. In order to look at the bronze snake on the pole, they had to drag themselves to where they could see it. Now, we just read the text. Did you see that in the text? No, it's not there. It's not there. They had to drag, they, this is a subtle way of adding works to the God, got to do something. Can't simply believe, can't simply look. They had to drag themselves to where they could see it. They were in no position to glance flippantly at the pole. This is language he added. I don't see that term in numbers. They just look. Didn't say how, how to look. Didn't say you got to look with all your heart. You got to look this way and got to stare this way. He says, just Look. Look, they were no, he said, no, no, they were in no position of glance flippantly at the pole and then proceed with lives of rebellion. Well, John, they did afterwards, but they were still physically healed. They actually did rebel against God further. If you study the children of Israel, but they were healed at that point physically. Most readers will re rightly regard these comments as totally without support from the biblical text and numbers. MacArthur is guilty of distorting the obvious simplicity of our Lord's illustration about saving faith. And I heartily agree. Now, I want to elaborate on another individual in history. This man was Charles Haddon Spurgeon. He came to faith in Christ with a similar text of the simplicity of faith. Isaiah 49.22. I have it here in the King James. Look unto me. And be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. Another Old Testament passage that shows the simplicity of faith. And this is how Spurgeon came to faith in Christ. Simply look. Look unto me and be saved. Now, it's interesting that Merrill Unger 
applies this to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, ultimately, this is a passage referring to Christ's second coming. It's in the context of Christ's second coming and its millennial kingdom. And Angra says this, The Lord calls to all nations, all the ends of the earth, to look to him in faith and be saved. This is the invitation of the crucified, risen, glorified Christ returning to set up his millennial kingdom. Salvation will be offered on the basis of faith in the King of Glory's finished redemptive work. For he is God incarnate, David's Son, humanity, and David's Lord, deity. Psalm 110, 1 through 7. And this shows the simplicity of looking to the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Spurgeon did that one, one day around January 6th, I think, 1850. He wandered into a small church and heard a man proclaim that very passage. I'm going to read through that passage. And usually I don't read this much, but I think it's very important. I was reading the biography of Spurgeon, and we're going to go through that. I'm going to read this account of when he came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's take a look at Spurgeon's autobiography, and uh, we'll begin here. Once God preached to me a similitude in the depth of winter, and this is when Spurgeon came to faith in Christ. The earth had been black, and there was scarcely a green thing or a flower to be seen. As I looked across the fields, there was nothing but barrenness, bare hedges and leafless trees, and black, black earth, wherever I gazed. On a sudden, God spoke and unlocked the treasures of the snow, and white flakes descended until there was no blackness to be seen. And all was one sheet of dazzling whiteness. It was at that time that I was seeking the Savior. And not long before I found him, and I remember well that sermon which I saw before me in the snow. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like Clemson, they shall be as wool." Personally, I have to bless God for many good books. I thank him for Dr. Dodge's Rise and Progress of the Religion in the Souls, for Baxter's Call to the Unconverted, and for uh, Aline's Alarm to Sinners, and for James's Anxious Inquirer. But my gratitude, most of all, is due to God, not for books, but for the preached word. And that to address to me by a poor, uneducated man a man who had never received any training for the ministry and probably will never be heard of in this life, a man engaged in business, no doubt of a humble kind during the week, but who had just enough of the grace to say on the Sabbath, look unto me and be saved all, all the ends of the earth. The books were good, but the man was better. <laughs> I like that. The revealed word to me, Mr. Start there. The revealed word awakened me, but it was pre the preached word that saved me. And I must ever attach peculiar value to the hearing of the truth. For by it, I receive the joy and peace in which my soul delights. While under concern of soul, I resolved that I would attend all the places of worship in the town where I lived. And so he's describing his experience of seeking God by going from church to church to church. To hear a message that would bring comfort to his soul. He said, I resolved to attend all the places of worship in the town where I lived in order that I might find out the way of salvation. I was willing to do anything and be anything if God would only forgive my sin. I set off determined to go around to all the chapels, and I did go to every place of worship, but for a long time I went in vain. I do not, however, blame the ministers. One man preached divine sovereignty. I could hear him with pleasure, but what was that sublime truth to a poor sinner who wished to know what he must do to be saved? There was another admirable man who always preached about the law, <laughs> but what was the use of plowing up ground that needed to be sown? Spurgeon really has a way with words here. <laughs> another was a practical preacher. I heard him, but it was very much like a commanding officer teaching maneuvers of war to a set of men without feet. <laughs> what could I do? All his exhortations were lost on me. 
I knew it was said, believe on the Lord Jesus and thou shalt be saved, but I did not know what it was to believe on Christ. These good men all preached truth suited to many and their congregations who were spiritually minded people. But what I wanted to know was, how can I get my sins forgiven? And they never told me that. I desire to hear how a poor sinner under a sense of sin might find peace with God. And when I went, I heard a sermon, be not deceived, God is not mocked, which cut me up still worse, but did not bring me into rest. I went again another day in the next text, and the text was something about the glories of the righteous, nothing for poor me. I was like a dog under the table, not allowed to eat of the children's food. <laughs> I went time after time, and I could honestly say that I did not know that I ever went without prayer to God. And I'm sure there was not a more attentive hearer than myself in all the place. For I planted and longed to understand how I might be saved. I sometimes think I might have been in darkness and despair until now, had it not been for the goodness of God in sending a snowstorm one Sunday morning while I was going to a certain place of worship. When I could go no further, I turned down a side street and came to a little primitive Methodist chapel. You think that was by accident? <laughs> Here again is the miracle of providence. He wasn't headed out to that chapel, but circumstances, God directed him to that place. I heard of the primitive Methodists, how they sang so loudly that they made people's headaches. <laughs> But that did not matter to me. I wanted to know how I might be saved. And they could tell me I did not care how much they made my headache. <laughs> the minister did not come that morning. He was snowed up, I suppose. Think about that. So the guy filling in was not even the regular minister. This layman. At last, a very thin-looking man, a shoemaker or tailor of something of that sort, went up into the pulpit to preach. Now, it is well that preachers should be instructed, but this man was really stupid. <laughs> he was obliged to stick to his text for the simple reason that he had little else to say. The text was, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all ye ends of the earth. He did not even pronounce the words rightly, but that did not matter. There was, I thought, a glimpse of hope for me in that text. The preacher began thus, My dear friends, this is a very simple text indeed. It says, look. Now, looking don't take a great deal of pains. It ain't lifting your foot or your finger. It is just look. Well, a man didn't need to go to college to learn to look. You may be the biggest fool, and yet you can look. A man need be worth a thousand a year to be able to look. Now, that's, that's back then. That's a lot of money. <laughs> uh, anyone can look. Even a child can look. But then the text says, look unto me. I, he said, in broad Essex. Many on ye are looking to yourselves, but it's no use looking there. You never find any comfort in yourselves. Some look to God the Father. No, look to him by and by. Jesus Christ said, look unto me. Some of you say we must wait for the Spirit's working. You have no business with that just now. Look to Christ. The text says, look unto me. Then the good man followed up his text in this way. Look unto me. I am sweating great drops of blood. Look unto me. I am hanging on the cross. Look unto me. I am dead and buried. Look unto me. I rise again. Look unto me. I ascend to heaven. Look unto me. I'm sitting at the Father's right hand. O oh, poor sinner, look unto me. Look unto me. 
When he had gone to about that length and managed to spin out 10 minutes or so, he was at the end of his tether. <laughs> then he looked at me under the gallery, and I dare say with so few present, he knew me to be a stranger. Just fixing his eyes on me as if he knew all my heart, he said, young man, you look very miserable. Well, I did, but I've not been accustomed to have remarks made from the pulpit on my personal appearance before. <laughs> however, it was a good blow struck right home. And he said, however, it was a good blow struck right home. He continued, and you always will be miserable, miserable in life and miserable in death if you don't obey my text. But if you obey now, this moment, you will be saved. Then lifting up his hands, he shouted as only a primitive Methodist could do. <laughs> Young man, look to Jesus Christ. Look, look, look. You have nothing to do but to look and live. I saw it once, a way of salvation. I knew not what else he said. I did not take much notice of it. I was so possessed with that one thought. Like as when the brazen serpent was lifted up, the people only looked and were healed. So it was with me. I had been waiting to do 50 things, but when I heard the word look, what a charming word it seemed to me. Oh, I looked until I could almost have looked my eyes away. There and then the cloud was gone, the darkness has rolled away, and that moment I saw the sun. And I could have risen that instant and sung with the most enthusiastic of them, of the precious blood of Christ and the simple faith which looks alone to him. Oh, that somebody had told me this before. Notice that. Trust Christ and you shall be saved. Yet it was no doubt all wisely ordered. And now I can say, Ere since by faith I saw the stream, the flowing wounds supply, redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. Now I'm gonna, not going to read all of this, but I would encourage you to read this whole section. This is very, very encouraging. And uh, he indicated that uh, as a result of faith, his chains fell off. He was joyful as a result of understanding the simplicity of faith. And I'll just read a couple highlights I highlight in the blue. He said this, I had passed from darkness into marvelous light, from death to life, simply by looking to Jesus. Now that's clear. <clears throat> that's clear. I have been delivered from despair, and I was brought into such a joyous state of mind that when they saw me at home, they said to me, something wonderful has happened to you. <laughs> and I was eager to tell them all about it. Oh, there was joy in the household that day when all heard that the eldest son had found the Savior and uh, knew himself to be, a, to be forgiven, bliss compared with which all earth's joys are less than nothing and vanity. Yes, I looked at Jesus as I was and found in him my Savior. Thus had the eternal purpose of Jehovah decreed it, and as the moment before, there was none more wretched than I was. So within that second, there was none more joyous. It took no longer time than does lightning flash. Think about that. It was done. And notice, never had it been undone. Huh. I looked and lived, and leaped in joyful liberty as I beheld my sin punished upon the great substitute and put away forever. Isn't that wonderful? I looked unto him as he bled upon that tree. His eyes darted a glance of love unutterable into my spirit, and in a moment I was saved. Looking unto him, the bruises that my soul had suffered were healed. The gaping wounds were cured. The broken bones rejoiced. The rags that had been covered, covered me were all removed. My spirit was white as the spotless snow of the far off north. I had melody within my spirit, for I was saved, washed, cleansed, forgiven through him that did hang upon the tree. 
he goes on to talk about that. And I have another things I want to comp, com, comment on it. Notice here, the Holy Spirit who enabled me to believe gave me peace through believing. And uh, certainly we are peace with God in Romans 5, 1. Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. But we can have the peace of God by, by believing the truth of God's word. And he says he gave him peace through what? Believing. He goes on to state here, in the blue here, that great and excellent man, Dr. Johnson, used to hold the opinion that no man ever could know that he was pardoned. We have people like that today, right? No assurance. That there was no such thing as assurance of faith. Perhaps if Dr. Johnson had studied his Bible a little more and had a little more of the enlightenment of the Spirit, he too might have come to know his own pardon. Certainly he was no very reliable judge of theology any more than he was of porcelain, which he at once attempted to make and never succeeded. <laughs> I think both in theology and porcelain, his opinion is of very little value. <laughs> you don't think preachers can be sharp? <laughs> How can a man know that he is pardoned? There is a text which says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It is irrational to believe, is it, is, it, is it irrational to believe that I'm saved? He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, says Christ in John's Gospel. I believe on Christ. Am I absurd in believing that I have eternal life? I think you understood here, assurance was of the essence of saving faith, right? If you believe the Gospel, then that brings assurance. I find the Apostle Paul speaking by the Holy Ghost and saying, There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God. If I know that my trust is fixed on Jesus only, and that I have faith in him, were it not 10,000 times more absurd for me not to be at peace than for me to be filled with joy unspeakable, it is but taking God at his word. I like that definition of faith. God says it. Just agree that it's true. Taking God at his word. When the soul knows as a necess necessary consequence of its faith, that is, is saved. I took Jesus as my savior and I was saved. And he goes on to talk about that. Um, let's get forward here. Has Jesus saved me? I dare not speak with any hesitation here. I know he has. His word is true. Therefore, I am saved. My evidence that I am saved does not lie in the fact that I preach or that I do this or that. All that my hope lies in is this, that Jesus Christ came to sinners, to save sinners. I am a sinner. I trust him that he came to save me, and I am saved. <laughs> And so he's not trusting on any works to prove he's born again. You're not looking to yourself. And just like the illustration by Locker, we don't look to those who are bitten. We don't look to our wound. We look to Christ. And that's faith. And that's what Spurgeon is doing here. He's not looking to his works to be saved. So many people today think you're saved because, you know, you do X, Y, and Z, and that proves your salvation, you're trying to, Look at your works, and what if you fail this week and not the next? Well, you may persevere. You may, you know, and if they, because of that false doctrine, logically, you can never be sure of your salvation before the Lord takes you home. That's a false teaching. And Spurgeon did not believe that. I think he, he inherited Calvinism from John Gill. If you understand his predecessor, John Gill was a hardcore five point Calvinist. But you know what? He went against John Gill. In a lot of ways. He adopted some of that terminology, but he had a clear understanding of the gospel. And, uh, you know, I was reading a little bit about Spurgeon's life. I wish I could read a lot of the things he did in his lifetime, but they say over 20,000 people came to know Christ as Savior in his, in his ministry. And over a million heard him preach. And there was one man who was filling in in a small church on a snowy day who read a text and had a 10-minute sermon, and Spurgeon was saved. 
I think this is very important. That God can use any of us for his honor and glory and his work. Now, let me read further here. He says, yet I know by a full assurance that I am justified by faith which is in Christ Jesus. You know, Spurgeon did not doubt his salvation from that point forward. And we sang the hymn, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. It's funny, I grew up, and I understand a little bit about the Methodist. <laughs> um, went to a holiness camp, and I was in the choir. And we used to sing, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine, a little foretaste glory divine. But none of those people really believed that. <laughs> Either that or they thought they had assurance just for a little bit until they sinned or did some whopper of a sin. They're singing Fanny Crosby's Blessed Assurance and they're not being assured. Spurgeon says, I know by full assurance that I'm justified by faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And treated as if I had been perfectly just and made an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ, though by nature I must take my place among the most sinful. Hmm. So he understands imputed righteousness. He understands his standing before the Lord. He goes on to state this. I've always, I was, have always concerned, I've always concerned with Luther and Calvin that the sum and substance of the gospel lies in the word substitution. Substitution. Christ standing in the stead of man. If I understand the gospel, it is this. I deserve to be lost forever. The only reason why I should not be damned is that Christ was punished in my stead. There is no need to execute a sentence twice for sin. Think about that, double jeopardy, right? On the other hand, I know I cannot enter heaven unless I have a perfect righteousness. I am absolutely certain I shall never have any, have one of my own, for I find I sin every day. This is Spurgeon. <laughs> You know, we don't put him on a pedestal, though he's a great man of God, he was still a sinner. But then Christ had a perfect righteousness, and he said, there, poor sinner, take my garment and put it on. You shall stand before God as if you were Christ, and I will stand before God as if I had been a sinner. I will suffer in the sinner's stead, and you shall be rewarded for works which you did not do, for which I did for you. He goes on to state, he died for me. This is the root of every satisfaction I have. He put all my transgressions away. He cleansed me with his precious blood. He covered me with his perfect righteousness. He wrapped me up in his own virtues. He has promised to keep me while I abide in this world from its temptations and snares. And when I depart from this world, he has already prepared for me a mansion in heaven of unfading bliss and a crown of everlasting joy that shall never, never fade away. You don't think we have a confident man here? <laughs> Absolutely confident. And it's not because of his goodness, but because of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross. He goes on to state, what I know of him is very little compared with the matchlessness of his grace. Would that I know more of him and that I could tell it out better. And so for all of us, will we know more about Christ? And we have the hymn, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus. Think about the simplicity of faith. Spurgeon understood that. Spurgeon understood assurance based on faith in what Christ has done. And that's what the gospel is. Don't make faith into a work. It's not a work. Jesus did the work. And you simply rest in him. And you can have the same peace that Spurgeon had by believing the gospel by faith. For by grace you've been saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is a gift of God, not a works lest any man should boast. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the simplicity, the simplicity of this passage in Numbers and the typology of the Savior 
and his sacrifice and by simply looking, having eternal life, the simple glance of faith away from self, away from goodness, to Jesus Christ who finished the work. We thank you, Lord, the moment we have that faith, the moment we look to Christ and what he accomplished as our only hope of heaven, we are born again. We have eternal life. We are clothed with your son's righteousness. We are justified by faith. We have the indwelling Holy Spirit and 50 things that you've given to us at that second. Father, I pray, Lord, that we might not ever garble the gospel, but that we might preach it clearly and accurately, giving honor and glory to the Savior who did the work, and all we do is accept it by faith in him. And it's to him be all praise, honor, and glory. In Christ's name, amen.